Uh, uh, welcome everybody um, to this event. Uh, my name is Evan Hammond. I'm one of the lecturers in the law school um, at QUT. Um, and I'd like to welcome you here. I'd also like to um, pay my respects to the elders, um, past, present and emerging, and acknowledge the important role that Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islanders continue to play within our QUT community. Um, thank you also to the um, uh, ILGG program and the Faculty of Law for funding this event. I think it's important that we have these events where community um, come in and engage with the university, see what we do, and we're not just living in ivory towers um, or whatever that type of tower this is. Um, we've got a pretty packed uh, program tonight. Uh, our focus is on law and shorebirds, so hopefully it, it hits the right balance for you in the audience. There is um, a few things I need to mention. Uh, the fire exits are at the back. Uh, toilets are out as you just came in, would just be behind you in the lifts. Um, what else? Each uh, speaker will go for about 15 minutes, so we'll have one after the other. And then at the end, we'll have questions for about 30 minutes. So I understand some of you may need to leave. There's another event I hear at 7 o'clock, which is fine. Um, but um, if you can stay till 7.30, we'd be most grateful. Ah, one last thing, uh, the event is being recorded. Um, so if you're not comfortable with that or you don't want to consent to that, please come and talk to me um, and we can sort something out. Um, right, okay, so welcome everybody. Uh, I'd like to introduce our first speaker. Um, our first speaker is Dr. Rob Clemens. Rob works for BirdLife Australia. Uh, he has a Bachelor of Science and also a PhD. Uh, 15 years ago, he moved to Australia where he started working for BirdLife, and I understand he's back there again. Uh, so, uh, welcome Dr. Clemens, or Rob, as um, he's okay being called, and uh, we look forward to your talk. Thank you. Thanks, Evan. It's good to be here today. Um, so, about 15 years ago, I moved to Australia, and my first job was with, with BirdLife. And they told me at BirdLife that I was going to study migratory shorebirds, and my heart just kind of sank. Because this place has parrots and Maui fowl and all kinds of things. It has some really cool birds. But I was told I was going to work on migratory shorebirds, and in the 15 years that I've been studying these birds, I've fallen in love with these birds, and I'm hoping that I can sort of bring you along the journey of why I love these birds and why I'm really worried about these birds. So one of the first things that, that sort of made me stop in awe and wonder about these birds were these clouds of birds that form when you get these big flocks of 10,000 birds that are making noise in the sky. And it turns out a lot of these birds, when they go up to their breeding grounds also turn these lovely red colors. So they're not just dull, while well, they're dull and brown here in Australia, when they go up north, they're quite lovely. So, so that helped. I became a little more enamor enamored with these birds. But I guess the thing that I, I'm most captivated about regarding these birds are the journeys that they make across the globe each year. So these birds are breeding in places like Siberia and Alaska. And some of these birds are able to make an eight-day nonstop flight from Alaska to, say, Moreton Bay. And they're flapping the entire time. And so they're, they're not stopping to sleep. They're not stopping to have a drink. They're not stopping for food. Um, energetically, physiologically, that's a remarkable feat to be able to across the globe, do they're sort of the endurance athletes of the animal kingdom, right? There's nothing like them. And if you're at all interested in, in biology, um, the physiological adaptations that have to be present in order for this to, to occur are amazing. If I was a migratory shorebird, I would have to put on five kilos a day in weight until in two weeks I weighed 200 kilos and because that makes it easier to fly, right? Just get really fat. <laughs> and my heart would have to grow. My digestive organs would shrink. Uh, 
And my wife says I do this all the time, and it's why I study shorebirds, but apparently they're able to rest different sections of their brain independently so they don't need to sleep. I sleep, but I also apparently rest different sections of my brain. The other thing that's remarkable about these birds is at two months of age, maybe three months of age, they can come from Alaska to Australia, to Moreton Bay, without their adults or their parents showing them the way. So at three months of age, you're able to navigate across the globe without a sextant, right? These birds are using the position of the sun and the stars and the moon as a calendar and as a clock, but also as a, a navigational aid. And there's more and more evidence that's suggesting that a lot of these migratory birds have a visual compass in their eye. So the magnetic fields of the Earth create polarized light that's most acute at the North Pole and the South Pole. When that highly polarized light hits the retina of a migratory bird, it lights up. So if you're in the Southern Hemisphere and you're a migratory bird, you've got this little dot that's always pointing south. And if you're in the Northern Hemisphere, you've got this little dot that's always pointing north. So they have all kinds of tricks that allow them to travel across the globe. And there's also this treasure trove of data. So there are over 30 years of data collected right across the continent. And guess what? You can ask more interesting scientific questions when you have data to play with. Unfortunately, that data is showing us that some of these birds are declining drastically. 50 to 80 percent over the last few decades. So these populations are really in trouble. And the list of birds that are declining is increasing as we look at the data. But the declines are not equal across species. So curlew sandpiper is declining the most. Redneck stint isn't declining nearly as much. And if you look at the the y-axis here, that's the rate of decline of, of these migratory birds. And if you look at the x-axis, that's how reliant those birds are on the Yellow Sea. So if you're more reliant on the Yellow Sea, you're declining more rapidly. So what's happening in the Yellow Sea? Well, the Yellow Sea is that area where the red circle is between China and Korea. And it's the place where almost all our migratory shorebirds have to stop on their northward migration in order to fatten up yet again before they go to their breeding sites. And the worst example of what's happened to migratory shorebirds happened in Simon Gum about 10 years ago. So it was a place that supported about 200,000 migratory shorebirds. And so if you can imagine going out to Manly and watching the tide going out, and then being able to walk all the way to Moreton Island. That's the size of the tidal flats in Korea and China, these huge 10 kilometer wide tidal flats. And then imagine building a seawall from Bribey Island to Moreton Island to Strati and back to the mainland, and then we're gonna pump out all the water from Moreton Bay. That's the scale of this project, of what happened in, in 2008. And not surprisingly, when you take away that much habitat, the birds go missing. 90,000 great knots are no longer found on the planet as a result of this project. 30% of the population of a migratory shorebird disappeared because of one project. Simon Gum in South Korea is not the only place where this is happening. These are five kilometer wide uh, tidal flats in uh, in Bohai Bay in China. That was 1975, right? And that's 2010. Vast changes happening across the coastlines of the Yellow Sea, huge changes. And there was a project at UQ that looked to quantify, well, how much habitat have we lost in those areas? And looked at tons of satellite imagery and estimated that Maybe two-thirds of the intertidal habitat has been lost in the Yellow Sea in the last 50 years. <clears throat> so this is something that's been going on for a very long time. And it's something 
that makes Simon Goom look like just a drop in the bucket, just a small little project. So one of the interesting things about migratory shorebirds or migratory birds generally is they can be impacted anywhere along the flyway. In the last few decades, it looks like populations have been impacted most in these refueling areas in places like the Yellow Sea. But certainly during European settlement, it's possible that we, with all the things that we did to wetlands in this place, we reduced the population here, you know, a century ago. So, and we're just starting to understand that these things are somewhat connected. There's interactions between what happens here and what, how well they might survive the trip. So it's not all one place or another. There's more interactions that we're just starting to understand. So way up north, this is a Pacific golden plover on the Arctic. That's its predicted breeding distribution. Um, in cli under climate change, that's the suitable ecological niche, climatic niche for these species. So it virtually disappears. So it means these birds are likely going to be facing huge adaptation pressure if climate change continues. Here in Australia, this is a bird that arrives, and this is what it's got to look like before it takes off. So it's got to put on all that weight. And one of the things that gets in the way of that weight gain program is an exercise program that's making them lose that weight. So if there's thousands of people moving to the coast, you might get shorebirds that are sort of um, not able to put on that weight. There's also some huge problems happening here in Australia. In 2010, water stopped flowing into the Coorong, and the entire ecosystem collapsed. Tens of thousands of shorebirds left that system. There's a Ramsar site in Victoria that used to flood every four years, and now it floods every 50 years. So there's been some massive changes in the wetlands in this country. One of the good news stories about this is we know how to manage water for a lot of these birds, a lot of the water birds and a lot of the shorebirds. But things like eastern curlew feeding habitat, we have no idea how we would go about replacing that, right? But for these other areas, if we have a eutrophic wetland somewhere, we could create a wetland, like a salt pan, that works really well for migratory shorebirds. But likely the invertebrate diversity that's found in that wetland would be less, and it might not be as pretty a place to visit. You might not have as many plants. So some of the values that are associated with this matter of national environmental significance wouldn't be captured in some of these potential offsets. The legal framework has done a great job in Australia of minimizing harm. So this is the Hunter Estuary in New South Wales, and those shaded areas have been left in large part because of, of shorebirds. So the planning framework that we have has enabled us not to pave the whole place, right? But there's a real open question within my mind and the legal framework that we currently have. How many of these birds are we gonna conserve? We could call success because we have a critically endangered bird and we've got a thousand of them left in the landscape. But unless we start having a conversation about, well, do we want that number to be 300,000 or 1,000? Unless we start having that conversation, we could lose these majestic flight flocks of birds, right? There's a lot of other critters that we don't have this kind of data on. There's probably a lot of other fauna that are, have the same story that we could tell if we only had the data to be able to tell it. And Rich, who's in the audience, usually finishes on this slide, which is the yellow season is a disaster area for migratory shorebirds and we need to do something about it, right? And he's absolutely right. But there are some really cool things happening. And this is just one example. So Henry Paulson, was Secretary of Treasury in the US. Um, he's an investment banker, um, has relationships with China, 
started the Paulson Institute after he retired to look at economic and environmental problems, argued to, made the argument to the Chinese government that these coastal wetlands um, protect cities against storm surge, sea level rise, and provided $30 billion in ecosystem services. And oh yeah, it's also good for shorebirds. Now I'm not giving Paulson all the credit on this, but in 2018, after that argument was made, um, they said, you know what, we're not gonna reclaim any more coastal wetlands in the, in the Yellow Sea, unless it's in the national interest, or it's required for public welfare, or for national defense. And here in Australia, we're thinking about reclaiming internationally important wetlands in the national interest because apparently apartment complexes are now in the national interest. So anyway, that, that's all the time I have. I just wanna thank all the organizations that make this work possible and the volunteers who, who put the, the data together, the many researchers, many who are not pictured here who are responsible for most of what I talked about, people who've uh, helped me over the years, and these two little monkeys. Thank you, Rob. Um, I'm always a bit envious of uh, scientists um, because of their ability to put up awesome pictures and graphs and slides and things like that. Uh, us lawyers, not so great at it, so forgive me if there's too much text going on in this um, presentation. Um, uh, but here we go. So the, top, the topic of my presentation is uh, international and national law. So I'll be talking about the frameworks that exist at a, a global level as well as a bilateral level and how they're brought into the national legislative framework in Australia. I don't want it to just be a descriptive talk, so uh, towards the end I'll uh, talk about some of the kind of hot topic legal issues that are going on and some of you may be aware uh, that the EPBC Act is up for um, reform um, this year. Uh, right, so here's the coverage. I'll go quickly through the Ramsar Convention, um, which I think is probably one of the more important conventions for shorebird habitat. Uh, the World Heritage Convention as well I'll touch on. I'll talk about the CMS, which is the Convention on Migratory Species, otherwise known as the Bonn Convention. The bilaterals or the MBAs, the Migratory Bird Agreements. Um, there are um, more than three of these in the Asia-Pacific region, indeed across the world. But uh, these are the main three that Australia has signed. In fact, the only three Australia has signed. Then I'll talk about how that's brought down into the EPBC Act, right? So the national environmental legislation that we've had since 1999. And I'll finish um, with some of the challenges of implementation. So the Ramsar Convention, most of you or some of you may be familiar with this, um, uh, this treaty, a global treaty, one of the first international environmental law treaties signed in 1971. Australia was a first mover under the treaty. We um, have been a champion, in inverted commas, up to a certain point. When I say up to a certain point, obviously cases like the Toondah Harbour and the example Rob mentioned before are uh, bringing to the fore some of the issues about whether Australia is really living up to its obligations under the treaty. So numbers of sites under the treaty. Um, this is quite interesting for me to see. Australia is, what, number five out of just numbers of sites. The UK, 175. Um, and that, I suspect, is to do with the scientific uh, experience in that country around wetlands, as well as the long history the United Kingdom have had in water bird watching and monitoring of those, those species and engagement with uh, the Ramsar Convention. Um, Interestingly, this doesn't reflect the size of the Ramsar Estate. Australia's Ramsar Estate is 8.5 million hectares. Japan, who has 53, is 150,000 hectares. So that is just a little bit bigger than Moreton Bay, which is one Ramsar site. Here are the Ramsar sites across the world. About, um, I think, it, about 15 to 18 percent of Ramsar of wetlands, total wetlands across the world, are Ramsar sites. Uh, this, bear in mind, the treaty is only talking about wetlands of international importance, 
So they have to reach a certain threshold um, amongst indicative factors. If you look in, um, um, it's heavily focused on Europe, which is not uh, by any means when you look across the other treaties, for example, the World Heritage Treaty, we see a similar disproportionate response and collection of um, sites in Europe. Canada, I'm told, has 25% of the world's wetlands. That You can see there it's not represented. Here are the sites in Australia. Uh, for us in Queensland, uh, if you can see, uh, it's not working. Um, two that are within the zone of the Great Barrier Reef. So the Great Barrier Reef Marine Park area um, under the World Heritage Convention also has these two coastal sites. Uh, Corio, Bol and Corio, Shoalwater Bay and Bowling Green Bay. So what are the obligations under Ramsar? It's all good and well to identify sites, but there needs to be some rule or standard or something within that regime that we're trying to make states adhere to. Now, interestingly, the convention doesn't say you must conserve these wetlands. What it says is you must maintain, well, before that it says you must use these wetlands through the principle of wise use, right? Different from a blanket, you must conserve these wetlands. It's w it was a, um, um, uh, a concept of ecological character comes into that, which I'll show you in a second. It's a non-regulatory regime, so we mean by that it doesn't have strict rules that you can actually enforce against a state and query whether any international environmental law has the ability to do that. Um, states report three yearly, and uh, as the last point there notes, there's been a trend generally away from Wetlands for birds towards wetlands for people, and we see this emphasis on uh, the wise use concept. The maintenance of the ecological character. So this term is, or this phrase, is the underlying um, standard at which um, states at the national level are meant to maintain uh, the ecological character of their Ramsar sites. Um, what does that mean? Well, the combination of the ecosystem components, processes and benefits or services. So it essentially breaks ecological character down into three components. And increasingly the convention is asking states like Australia to describe exactly these components, the processes, for example, nutrient cycling, uh, vegetative productivity and so forth, and the services to humans, known as ecosystem services. So these are the three, uh, the three components which the convention is increasingly asking states to um, describe. Um, okay, so that's Ramsar. I want to move quickly because I've got to get to my critique of the EPBC Act. So uh, we've got the Convention of Migratory Species, which is broader than just birds, right? Also whales, dolphins, turtles, things like that. Um, there's a clear prohibition on the taking of migratory species. Um, w there is some watered down language within the convention, as we see across other conventions as well. Shall take best measures, shall endeavour to, shall within the resources of the state do this. And that obviously pulls back the legal requirement on the state to um, adhere to that obligation. Um, importantly, there are countries across that fly across our East Asia Australasian Flyway that are not, except for Brazil, that are not signed up to this uh, convention, being Russia, China, the Koreas, and Japan. Uh, I heard last year that um, the Korea and China are also about to sign uh, the convention. Um, so that that diagram shows you who has signed it and who hasn't. Uh, the Green Party is the ones that have signed, and uh, the others are non-signatory but under MOU agreement parties. Right, world heritage, also important, but only in areas of world heritage. So everyone's familiar with the way in which um, communities have pushed, or I suggest anyway, the state to do more at the state level and the federal level with respect to the Great Barrier Reef. So that has kind of been our quintessential case study over the last 10 years of using international law to get real traction at the domestic level. Um, here are our World Heritage Sites. Some of you are more familiar with where shorebirds actually go, may um, be able to think around whether they actually would be or would not be within those areas. As I suggested before, the two Ramsar sites above Fraser Island are within that uh, zone. Right, so the migratory bird agreements, we have three of them, Jamba, Camba and Rock Amber. Um, Jamba signed in 1981 and the three look remarkably similar, although Jamba's got some obligations that are a bit kind of weird. Um, um, my uh, recent focus has been on Camber and looking at the legal arrangements under Camber and how well they're implemented both in China and in Australia. 
Um, there are three main obligations that seem to be very similar across the, the treaties. The first is uh, the prohibition on uh, taking birds and their eggs. The second is protection of habitat, i.e. the creation of sanctuaries. And the third is collaboration in research endeavours. So we see these, these uh, obligations or uh, requirements come out in each of those migratory bird agreements as well as the CMS. Uh, the habitat protection article has two limbs to it. The first is that parties, i.e. Australia and China, are obliged to establish sanctuaries, so reserves, protected areas, Ramsar estates, so forth, for the protection of their bird life. The second is that you should take appropriate measures to preserve and enhance the environment of migratory birds, including ensuring, ensuring uh, there is no direct damage on habitat, as well as restricting introduction of pest species. Now, to the EPBC Act. So, in my opinion and some other opinion of environmental lawyers at domestic level, the Act does a reasonably good job on face value of bringing in the requirements under these relevant treaties for shorebird protection. Now, that is to say that the real problem then lies, as we know, we're in a biodiversity crisis, including for shorebirds but also for many other species, in the implementation of the law. In Australia, uh, we have the EPBC Act. So for example, section 16, a person must not take an action that will have a significant impact on the ecological character of a Ramsar site. So more than just pulling it as a matter of national environmental significance and sticking it there, it actually draws on that concept of ecological character, which we saw in the convention, right? So a relatively sophisticated approach in national law. In this act, subsection 3, ecological character is the same meaning as the Ramsar Convention. So a direct correlation up the levels of governance to the international treaty. Here is a very interesting section 140. In deciding whether or not to approve for the purposes of this act, the taking, uh, sorry, an action which might impact significantly on a migratory species or habitat, the minister must not act inconsistently with those agreements. So query what is consistent and what is not. Right? The question then turns on what are the obligations under those agreements. Under the EPBC Act, we have terminology such as actions, controlled actions, um, assessment and referrals. The general way that it works is that if you have a, um, uh, an action, including any of those examples below, you're going to develop something, for example, Toonda Harbour, then you are, and it's going, to, it's going to have or likely to have a significant impact on a matter of national environmental significance, one of them which was, for example, a Ramsar site, the ecological character of a Ramsar site, then you need to refer your action. Once you refer your action, there are three possible um, uh, things that can happen under the Act. The first is, um, it's the minister decides that it's not a controlled action. So there's a threshold decision being made upon departmental advice, or should be anyway, that there is no significant impact on this matter of national environmental significance. No controlled action does not require assessment and approval. The second is, I'll go to the third one first, a controlled action. So we agree with you or we disagree with you and we think, thank you for referring it, we're going to determine your action to be a controlled action that must go through an assessment process and an approval process, right? And ends up with an EPBC Act approval. The, th the third one, which I've labelled as number two, are called these particular matter decisions. Something which was introduced into the Act in 2003 and to deal with a situation where the proponent, i.e. developer, goes and refers their action and instead of them saying uh, it's going to be significant or not, there is a negotiated exercise around whether it will be significant. And the department might say, okay, well, if you didn't do X, Y, Z, then we'll declare it not to be a controlled action. Hence the language of particular manner. So if it's undertaken in this particular manner, then we think it's not a controlled action. Problem with that is, you don't end up with a final approval and conditions within approval which are then monitored and enforced and so forth. Here are some of the problems with the EPBC Act which some of you may or may not be aware of. Since 1999, this is from the Guardian, uh, which is citing de departmental um, figures, 97% of EPBC Act decisions have been approved. 1.6% approved with conditions and 1.3% not approved. 
So your chances are pretty good of getting something across the line under the EPBC Act. This is the final points I wanted to make, and I'm sure we can have further discussion after the speakers. Um, is that this is, these, are the, these are the problems from a legal perspective for shorebirds, yes, but also across biodiversity in Australia. There has been a general trend at the national to the international level to procedurally comply, to report, but not to take any substantive action that relates to the substantive or aspirational obligations within those um, overarching treaties. Diplomatisation of international agreements is exactly what it says. There's a point, and the World Heritage Convention is, is, the, is the key uh, convention for this. Well, there's a point where the Department of Foreign Affairs and Trade takes over from the Environment Department to control the negotiations and um, what is decided at these, at these meetings. And uh, the last few points I want to make, a lack of cumulative environmental impact assessment, I won't get into that in too much, that's basically we're, we're doing things on a project by project basis without looking at the landscape uh, impacts, um, and EPBC has done a poor job of that. Regulatory fragmentation, well we could spend a whole three days on that, talking about the different problems about who has responsibility for what aspects of environmental law in Australia, or more to the point, who should have um, responsibility. Uh, inadequate resourcing, well that stands for itself, financial and technical. Political discretion in the decision making, right, so that example that you probably are most of you aware of is the Toondah Harbour situation where the minister got the advice from the department and then decided to ignore it and disagree with it, right, and send it for a full assessment. So what allows that to occur? There is too much wriggle room in the decision making capacities within the Act, you know, something that does need to be tightened up. Um, and the last point I make, uh, the, last, the second last point I make is about the Yellow Sea argument, that there seems to be this kind of, um, well, everything, the problems are elsewhere. They're not in Australia and therefore uh, we don't have to worry about it for our particular project. The point I would make about that is, well, if you have a, a, sea, a, a single species, it's not our species, it's part of the world's heritage, right? We have a common obligation to care for that species and um, it also stands to reason that if, if they're suffering in other parts of the world, you're better off doing a far better job to conserve them in this part of the world. I mean, that would be the, the logical argument I would make. Uh, the final point I'll make before handing over to the next speaker is that there's been a significant lack of evaluation of our laws, policies and programs. And this means once we start something and we fund it, we don't then go in to look at how well it's actually done, re-evaluate and change it. And that is something which has been I think probably the single biggest problem since 1999 at least and probably further back. Anyway, my time has come to an end. Um, I would like to introduce our next speaker, um, Miss Elise Allerley. Uh, Elise, um, sorry, let me just get my notes. So she's currently studying a master's at Griffith University at the International Water Centre. She's a founding member of the Youth Engaged in Wetlands Initiative or Network. Uh, she's worked at Wetlands for the last several years, including with the Ramsar Secretariat in Switzerland and a Ramsar site in France. And I'd like to welcome Elise to uh, briefly talk about her experiences. A bit, a bit smaller. <laughs> thank you, Evan. Uh, and thank you very much for this opportunity. I really appreciate it. Uh, it's great to kind of uh, succeed right after your presentation because uh, our initiative is related to the Ramsar Convention and the idea is to get more young people involved in this um, global policy uh, and decision-making platform. So I'll just give you a very quick three-minute um, brief of what we did, what we're intending to do, and how we're intending to do it, uh, so just so you can get a bit of an idea of this growing initiative. Um, the first step that we took was really at the previous uh, Conference of the Party of the Ramsar Convention, which took place in Dubai last year. We had a, a great side event, if I can say so myself, <laughs> where we had 70, um, 70 participants from government representatives, NGOs, and young people from around the world, as well as high school students from Dubai and the UAE that came to uh, this particular side event. The idea was to showcase some of the examples where young people are already engaged in wetland conservation and are doing a uh, actions across the world, and to see what are the challenges and opportunities of getting young people meaningfully engaged in policy making. 
Um, so it was a great, <laughs> there was a great attendance um, and evolved into a workshop the next day where we tried to pin down what are the actions, what are the challenges that we're facing, what can we do about it. And all these really culminated and quite unexpectedly into a formulation of a use statement at the closing plenary um, of the Ramsar Convention. So with, um, w with a group of young, pe the young professionals that were there, we formulated this statement basically saying that young people are there and willing to work and participate in this uh, global solution uh, to try and uh, preserve wetlands and or conserve, conserve them and use them wisely. Um, following the term, um, and to, to say that we're here and willing to work and to ask governments to really stick to the commitments that they made during the, co the, the conference. Um, another suggestion was that the next conference, which is to be held probably in Senegal, should be around the theme of youth and wetlands, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but all, these, uh, all this momentum um, came from a couple years of, of work and even some previous ideas from before were in the conference in 2005 in um, Uganda. A group of children stood up and voiced their concerns to the conference. Not much has happened since then. Uh, there was in 2015 an award going for wetland champions, uh, young wetland champions. And so we're building on this momentum and we're also building on the momentum that other youth groups and other conventions have done. The CBD have had a uh, formalized group since 2012 uh, recognized within the convention. So that's a convention of biological diversity. And also the CITES convention have adopted a resolution back in 2016 aimed at youth engagement. Ooh, I realize <laughs> over time. Um, and there's a lot of examples out there. And so this is what we're building on. What is next for us? We have these, we, after the cup, a lot of energy, a lot of enthusiasm, and we have a lot of uh, several young people engaged in really making this um, a meaningful initiative. And so we've got these four different um, objectives, and I'm very happy to talk to you later about them if you're interested in this. And if you're interested in getting involved, if you're a student that wants to or get more involved in, in uh, wetland conservation, we're looking for l young lawyers or different different backgrounds really to try and get this up and up and running so really happy to see there's uh there's definitely youth engagement and interest uh to conserve wetlands and um that's that's it for me but i'm very happy to talk afterwards and uh, give you some more information thank you for the opportunity Thank you, Elise. So that's another important part of this shorebird conversation is these birds need to be conserved for future generations, the importance of intergenerational equity. Um, so our next speaker is Ms. Revel Poynton. She's a lawyer with uh, EDO Queensland. <coughs> um, she works on a broad range of law firm and litigation matters, and she's a lovely person. Please welcome Revel. <laughs> Thank you so much, Evan. That's uh, probably the nicest introduction, but the hardest to live up to <laughs> that I've ever had. Um, it's such a delight to be here with you all discussing shorebirds tonight. I, um, I must admit I'm of the same heart as Rob. The more I find out about these birds, the more um, absolutely in awe of them I am. So um, it is a topic that's become dear to my heart. Um, I did try for a, a funny pun or something clever, but this is the best I could do. Please forgive me. <laughs> um, so I'm looking, f I guess, at the next level. So um, Evan gave a great snapshot of our international obligations and commitments. And um, I'm going to be diving into a bit more what's happening um, once we move from the EPBC down into our state laws and even our local laws briefly. Um, and how are they actually playing out on the ground on our day-to-day -day decisions? Um, when we're making decisions on the impacts that are going to um, occur to our migratory shorebirds. Um, just a, a snapshot, so we are moving from the um, Commonwealth. I am going to look quickly at um, one of the policies that has been um, a plan that's been made under the Commonwealth that's non-statutory, but most of the other areas I'm looking at are from um, statutory Queensland and local laws. So under our EPBC Act, the EPBC Act um, does empower the making of a variety of plans and um, advices on conservation. Um, they have varying 
uh, power behind them as to whether um, they're required to be considered or not. Um, one of the first, uh, well, the first uh, wildlife conservation plans ever made was for migratory shorebirds in 2006. Um, it's, this plan is essentially a guide in terms of the conservation of 35 of our shorebirds. And these shorebirds weren't even actually listed as matters of national environmental significance when this was created. It was just created in recognition that a coordinated response was really needed to, um, to uh, manage our impacts on these, on these birds. In 2015 or 2014 it started, I understand, there was a review of, um, of this plan and a new one came out in 2015. Through the review we saw um, it wasn't going so well. Only four of the 31 actions that were um, objectives that were uh, stated as required for these birds to be protected had actually been completed. And we were still seeing that habitat loss as a result of development is uh, becoming the, the most significant impact on these birds, as we've heard tonight already. Um, and we also saw the listing as critically endangered of the Eastern Curlew and the Curlew um, Sandpiper. Um, and they're now under a different framework through conservation advices, which are actually non-statutory um, advices that are provided for more specific guidance on how to manage um, the impacts or avoid and manage the impacts on these species, but they don't actually have to um, be considered necessarily when uh, assessing a project under the EPPC Act. Uh, Act. This is taken from the plan. It's an objective in our 2015 plan to um, uh, try to protect and improve wetland habitats that the migratory shorebirds do depend on. And you'll see on this uh, column, uh, the second from the right, coastal development in Australia is um, one of the key threats to be mitigated. Um, and on the far right, that the Australian government and the state and territories all have a, a part to play in that. And so these are all our Queensland laws <laughs> that could potentially have um, something to do with um, migratory shorebirds. Those top four are probably the main laws that actually regulate development impacts. So development um, will be my focus for this evening. A lot of the others can be um, picked up from various activities, but as we know, habitat destruction is, is the key threat that these birds are facing. So these um, acts set out the decision-making processes for um, allowing those uh, impacts or not, and how. <clears throat> so I did want to jump into to Toonda Harbour. We often, at, at my office, it's a community legal centre, the Environmental Defender's Office. Um, so we field questions um, from the public around how uh, the law is operating to impact the environment and also what they can do about it to get involved. Um, and this is one uh, development that, as we've heard already tonight, has got a lot of public interest and I'm sure you're probably all aware of it. Um, so it's over in Cleveland where the ferries go out to, to North Stradbroke. They're planning on uh, a massive new development of multi-purpose development um, with all of the elements there, new port, um, 3,600 dwellings, um, hotels, car parks, um, and something of some reminiscent of South Bank um, on the foreshore and whatnot. Uh, and it's also on Ramsar listed wetlands. This is actually taken from the proponent's um, fact sheet um, and shows uh, a bit of a snapshot of, of how long the project's been going for um, when it was proposed. It's it, it states here that it's a, a PDA development. I'll explain in a second what that means. And um, that it's actually going through our federal environmental law process at the moment. So PDA is a priority development area. Um, you saw the long list of uh, laws that could affect um, shorebirds at the start. Um, most often development decisions are made under the Planning Act. Uh, your everyday uh, decision to, to build a house or even an apartment block usually comes through uh, some assessment process in the Planning Act and that can provide a requirement to consider the impacts it might have on, on shorebirds. Um, the Economic Development Act is a separate act that provides the state government with the power to declare a priority development area over a certain area. And that takes that area away from the Planning Act framework and um, creates a whole new development scheme uh, for that area. Um, the problems with this that we see from a, from a community legal centre point of view, in terms of 
trying to ensure there's accountability and transparency and process, one of the good things about our Planning Act is it does provide the ability for the people, the public, when they're concerned of developments, to actually be engaged in the process. Usually, not always, uh, there's an opportunity to put in submissions and if it's a really um, concerning development, um, potentially uh, appeal a decision. So have an independent court actually consider, was that the right decision um, given the circumstances and evidence put forward? What happens when you have a priority development area is you lose that power to actually take a decision to court. You might still have the ability to put in submissions on a development that's proposed, so have your concerns heard, which is great. But without that independent arbiter of was that the right decision, you've always got this element of um, potential political sway, let's be frank, on, on, our, um, on our government when they're considering the final decision uh, around these developments. Bit of a, a few statistics on the PDA in Toonda Harbour down the bottom there. Um, so total area is 67.4 hectares. There's 42 hectares that actually overlap our Moreton Bay Ramsar wetland. We also know, as, uh, as I mentioned, it's going through the EPBC process. Uh, it's been referred for a number of reasons. Um, it is going to uh, uh, incur on habitat of the eastern curlew and the curlew sandpiper that are both critically endangered. That's definitely one of them. Um, just recently, they put out for comment the terms of reference for the environmental impact statement. So what kind of things the proponent has to consider when they're doing their impact statement on the, on the area. So good on you if you put a submission in on that process. They will be actually putting um, out the EIS itself, the Environmental Impact Statement for comment as well, uh, at some point in the, in the next few months. So if you're interested in this, I do um, recommend you stay tuned for that. Um, in the terms of reference, I did see that they, do, they are requiring the proponent to consider the conservation advices around those um, two critically endangered birds, which is great, because as I said, it's not a statutory requirement. Um, that was the draft though, I'm not sure. I presume it's going to come out in the final, but we'll, we'll wait and see. Um, as uh, Evan touched on some of the critiques around the EPBC Act referral, we've got our own as well, uh, and definitely support what Evan was saying. Um, that one of the limitations is that also under the uh, EPBC Act, there's no merits review. Um, you only have judicial review, which is much more limited. It's just essentially, did the minister follow um, all the tick boxes in the legislation and consider it? And the minister can often get away with get, um, saying that they did just by saying, yes, I considered this. There's no actual question, was that the right decision on the evidence uh, at hand? So that means if there's none here in the EPBC Act process and there's none in the PDA process, there's no merits review going on. Um, there's no uh, independent assessment of whether this is the right, um, the right decisions are being made around this really um, sensitive habitat. A lot of ministerial discretion on approval, and as I mentioned, that it's not actually mandatory for these conservation advices to be followed. It's just recommended um, and required for them to be considered as well. So given our international commitments, why was a PDA actually um, declared over this Ramsar listed protected area? Why wouldn't a non-essential development such as a multi-purpose apartment block, as um, Robert was saying, over Ramsar-listed protected area be rejected as clearly inappropriate as was empowered under the Act at a federal level? And why aren't there any elements in our law that could actually um, definitely prohibit these kind of impacts when we know how endangered our shorebirds are? Just a quick snapshot of the other Queensland laws that um, can relate to, to migratory birds and are intended to assist in their protection is uh, our Nature Conservation Act also lists um, uh, some shorebirds as, uh, as threatened or um, seeks to protect them through creating offences uh, if you are to take, and that's a very broad decision of take, kind of include affecting some, a bird's habitat. <coughs> However, it's a defence if uh, an impact was already approved under another uh, framework. So for instance, uh, if you were uh, assessed under the Planning Act and allowed to give the framework, then often you can be, uh, it's a defence to undertake the, the impact on habitat. The Nature Conservation Act doesn't apply. Um, there are third party enforcement rights we'd like to remind people around this Act. So if, you're, if you see an impact on a, on a listed species under the Act and you don't think it's, it's been given permission to do that, then there are avenues that the public can actually hold the um, person to account. Uh, but we always recommend to contact the department first because obviously they have the resources to do that, um, hopefully. Not always. <laughs> um, wanted to briefly touch on our Environmental Offsets Act. 
uh, we have um, the ability to provide offsets. So I guess I'll step back. Offsets as a, as a concept is it's the idea that you can actually compensate for an impact by, um, by undertaking some other activity somewhere else. And maybe that's um, by creating more wetland space in another area where it's been eroded. Um, uh, if you have to impact on wetland for your development. Um, there is a Queensland Act that does provide for offsets um, where a, a development is being assessed. Uh, also, offsets can be required for PDA development. Um, and there's at a federal level an offsets policy that sits alongside our APBC Act that does allow offsets for that. Um, I'll have a... Uh, we have serious um, complaints around this offsets framework and I saw a lot of people's eyes roll as I um, mentioned the word, so I think a few people here uh, agree with me. But I um, have got good news in a second uh, about that. Mildly good news. Um, <laughs> don't get too excited. Um, and a Marine Parks Act uh, actually does um, uh, provide some uh, oversight in terms of impacts on shorebirds in our marine park areas, for instance in the Moreton Bay Marine Park. Uh, another assessment will have to occur for Tinder Harbour. I do have a fact sheet out the front. Um, as you go out on the table um, outside the room, there's a big pile of um, fact sheets on Tinder Harbour and a big pile on priority development areas. So do feel free to get one of those or check out the EDO website fact sheets. They're all on there as well. Um, that explain uh, in more detail the assessment process If you and always contact us if you've got more questions. But very quickly, um, I also wanted to mention the role of our local laws, which can play a really important role. As um, Rob mentioned, dogs and human impacts um, on migratory shorebird um, resting areas can have a really big impact. And, um, and local laws have been used and planning schemes have been used to try to um, minimise those impacts. Uh, for instance, the uh, Marine Parks Moreton Bay Zoning Plan makes it an offence to um, overly disturb shorebird habitat. And that can include if you're letting your dog loose and it's um, letting the birds, um, uh, making the birds all f uh, fly up. And we, as, as we heard earlier, that um, can significantly impact the bird's likelihood of getting to the next destination. So I do understand that there are serious issues around enforcement of these acts, uh, or of these laws, sorry. Um, it's great that they exist, but a law is useless if it's not enforced. Uh, so we're hoping that the council takes them a bit more seriously. Um, but as I say, good that it exists. Wanted to mention very quickly that our Offsets Act is under review um, at the moment. So you can get submissions in on our Queensland Offsets Act um, until 15th of April. We do have um, a bit of a briefing on our website if you um, want any tips. And I also am running a webinar tomorrow if you're super um, interested in it uh, with Martine Marin, Professor Martine Marin from UQ, who's um, probably known to a few people here. She's a fantastic scientist and does a lot of work in offsets. So I um, highly encourage a lot of people, if you're interested in um, getting in conservation uh, outcomes in Queensland, get involved in this, because it really is, um, uh, there are huge flaws that are leading to significant impacts in our environment. Um, I won't go through our EPBC uh, reforms. Uh, Evan did a great job of explaining that. But I do want to say, um, just briefly, the Senate inquiry into faunal extinction uh, have just, this committee that undertook that inquiry have just released their interim report. Um, and it does have two key recommendations that actually we need whole new environmental legislation as the recommendation one. And um, recommendation two is that we actually need an independent environmental protection agency in there. So um, these are pretty exciting recommendations for a Senate committee to come out and agree to. So hopefully we get some change in the future uh, around that. And we have an advice line if you ever have any questions yourself. So thank you so much for your time and look forward to the discussion. Thank you, uh, Revel. Uh, final speaker tonight, Dr. Robert Bush. Uh, Dr. Bush was born in Scotland, but let's not hold that against him. Um, he now is uh, semi-retired. He's current Secretary of Birds Queensland, uh, Queensland Ornitholo Ornithological Society, and a member of the Management Committee of the Queensland Way to Study Group, and a member of the Australasian Way to Study Group. And he knows an awful lot about birds. And please welcome uh, Robin, Robert for his talk. Well, thank you very much. Um, there's one person in the audience who will be rolling with laughter that I was born in Scotland. Uh, he knows who he is. I was actually born in London, but uh, of a Scottish family. 
and I don't have a Scottish accent because I went back home when I was seven. If you met my brother and sister, you'd be shocked to think we were part of the same family. They're much younger than I am. My talk tonight is about the relationship between doing field work and uh, law, regulation, and public policy, a sort of connecting of the two sides of the discussions tonight. Uh, I couldn't do any of this work without uh, doing a lot of t spending a lot of time with people from the Way to Study group who've given me uh, documents uh, over from the last 30-odd uh, years uh, and uh, other material that allowed me to answer the, try and get to grips with this question about does doing any of this field work really make any difference to the conservation of these birds? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't. I'm just going to give a snapshot of that. This is a eastern curlew, and if you look at it, it's got a slight malformation in the lower part of its bill, which is how I identify it every year when it comes back to the Wynnum waterfront. I've been looking at it and enjoying it for the last five years. It sometimes goes to the manly roost. When the tide comes in, it sometimes goes to Lytton. It's a bit of a loner. It's a female, and it's at least eight years old. If you know about birds, you can tell much of that by looking at it. It's also critically endangered. And the reason why we know it's critically endangered and the 1,400 or so others in the bay is because of the work over the last 28 years of people who've gone out systematically every month and counted it and others. So the link in a simple way between field science and legislation involves, in this case, systematic counting in line with some scientific principles and then a some form of analysis of that and then having legislation which allows us to determine its status. And in the, this case, it was the Queensland Way to Study Group data. Then if you go to the technical reports at the Commonwealth, it's Wilson's paper and Richard Fuller's work in 2009 uh, that is the uh, material that actually translates that data into something that can be then determined the status that the minister will determine as a, uh, a threatened species. There are others around in the, way, in the Victorian Way to Study Group and the Australasian Way to Study Group um, which completes that picture. Uh, so that is a simple, in a simple way. But what I want to do now is to actually extend that and begin to look at that and then other examples in more seriousness. This is the data that, um, that Wilson produced uh, in his paper, but I've extended it so that it goes from 2008, which was the end point of his, out until the, uh, till, uh, the end of last year. And what you see is, don't worry about the lines at the bottom, that the big line at the top is a Bartel Godwit dropping down dramatically, and the one underneath is the eastern curlew. And they start at the point at which the information that's used by the Commonwealth to term a threatened species is 2008 in this form. But if you go further on by 2000, although it was 2015, it was 2016 by the time the shorebird conservation uh, plan was, was produced, uh, it, the line continues to go down. So you see, while we have a crisis, that it takes some time to move from knowing something is a problem to beginning to do something about it. And then two months ago, at the Senate Standing Committee on the Environment and Communication, officers of the De Commonwealth Department of the Environment stated that they did not have the resources or means to know whether that implementation uh, was having an effect. And you can see the line continuing to go down. So if you were to do some form of public policy analysis on this, you can see that we have considerable procedural success in terms of field evidence, field adoption, the use of a useful act of the Commonwealth, and the declaring of a threatened species, which then can get special attention. But when you move beyond that into action to do something, and you get the conservation strategy, 2015-2016, and subsequent uh, plans and actions, um, and then you move to implementation, you find what is in the literature would be called policy implementa implementation failure. And this is very common in this area and in fact in quite a lot of public policy areas. We know a lot about and put a lot of effort 
into defining the problem and we do not have the resources or allocate the resources to dealing with the solutions, either at a legislative level or at a resourcing, re resourcing level. So let me go back to an earlier, happier time when things didn't look like this, were going to be like this, to 1992, when the Wader Study Group formed. The group, led by Peter Driscoll, and there are some people in this audience tonight who were part of that group, uh, had been looking since the late 1980s around Moreton Bay and discovering shorebirds and where they were and doing ad hoc counts. But from 1992, that became more formalized, and now there are about 60 people in Moreton Bay every month at exactly the same day, at exactly the same time, in each of the different uh, roosting areas doing exactly the same methodology to collect the count. And that systematic way gives this enormously good database. It was a good year. 1992 was the Queensland Nature Conservation Act, and it was also the year that the Morton Marine Park was gazetted. And Arthur, who's in the room here, uh, had a considerable amount to do that when he was working at Parliament House. If you look at the documents and so on around that time, you can see that the field work done by the Queensland Wader Study Group was some of the material, not all the material, that informed the policy deliberations which ended up with the Moreton Bay Marine Park being gazetted. If you then go on to 1993, you'll, uh, you, before I do that, that is the park. You, if you look at the park, you see it's made up of a series of zones. And this year, the Minister Enoch at the state level uh, has said that those zones will be reviewed uh, in terms of whether they grow, stay the same, change, or whatever. Uh, and in her letter to me, uh, it was clear that there were a number of sexual interests, not just cons not conservation in terms of, of uh, shorebirds, but also developers and so on. In other words, there are many players wanting to uh, influence this year those zonal uh, areas. It was quite easy then that in 1993, when the Morton Bay Ramsar site was developed, that it essentially took the, the marine park and um, uh, with a few exceptions, the little bumps and so on around the place, and created the Ramsar site. And what you'll see is that if you can see next to M1 there is the uh, mouth of the Brisbane River. There were certain areas that were excluded because they were seen as important for future economic development of the state there. And there were some areas like the Manly Harbour which had already been developed. Now at that time, the Wader Study Group recognised that in some particular places, the, um, away from or outside the Ramsar site, were important roost sites, which were significant. And I'm going to talk a bit about that work and its relationship, particularly to local government ordinance. These dots all the way up the side here are the 34 roost sites, the places where shorebirds go when the tides comes in. And I'm just going to look at two of those which were extinguished by development. In the north, Kakadu Beach, which was built after the, um, Ducks Creek was extinguished by the development of a canal estate. And in the south, Raby Bay, which is only 300 metres from the Toomba Harbour development, in which there was a site was extinguished and in its place Empire Point was built. Just going back up here, when a when a report was developed to look at what could be done about this, there was also talk with the developer and who came on board, and so did uh, the local uh, government authority, the local council. And they decided to change the plan and to develop a, uh, an area called Kakadu Beach, part of the beachfront, quite a bold thing to do, that would be reserved only for, um, for shorebirds uh, because Ducks Creek uh, was going to disappear. The local government uh, changed its ordinance, or, or, or ordinance regulations and so on. The developer built the site and the um, local council agreed to maintain it in perpetuity. However, down in the south, that, there it is today, then, you can see in 1984 the scrape 
uh, where the birds were and then it becomes a, uh, a canal development and then uh, Kakadu Beach is built. This is what it looked like. It had become quite um, damaged by 2016 and this is the evidence that the council put money back into it and this is what it looks like today. It's been reju rejuvenated after about 10 years. This is Raby Bay, uh, the development right next door to where Toomba Harbour is to be. It was an important roost site in the south. The same process went. This particular report is an extraordinary report about how to develop artificial roost sites um, with all sorts of incredible details, virtually lost now. I've been sitting in filing cabinets for years. But anyone interested in the technicalities of this, I recommend reading it. It's very insightful. It recommended building a roost site a bit like in the north on the side of this development. The developer rejected that idea, an alternative to use the spoil from this to develop an island off a little to the south of here, off Oyster Point, uh, where um, birds will often go, um, was rejected on uh, engineering grounds, and the site was a small scrape was developed somewhat begrudgingly, I would say, at the Empire Point some kilometres away. The report said they didn't think it w that would probably work, but they did that. So let's have a look at this. First of all, there's field evidence that shows that these two are, um, that both of these sites are very significant. The Raby Bay site was the largest roost site in the southern part. Local government regulation, developer support, local government investment and field monitoring continued in Kakadu, in Kakadu Roost and in Raby A it didn't. And there's the outcome. Before, in the north, there were nearly 5,000 birds roosting in that area. Today the highest count is near just under 9,000. In Raby Bay, we managed to extinguish a roosting site for nearly 5,000 birds and that is why in that particular part of the bay there are so few birds today. That's the consequence of uh, having regulations but having the choice whether you follow them or not. That is 300 metres away from, uh, from the new development at Toomba Harbour. I'm going to just do uh, two more things rather quickly. If we take the data that Wilson did and changed it and looked at whether any of that made any difference, you, and we look at roost sites and whether, what's happening to, despite numbers going down, where birds are going, you'll find that some roost sites are declining, some are increasing. And they're in the north, in the middle, and the south. So what's happening? In the north, the large area is declining. Those are areas along the Ramsar site shorelines where public and birds intermingle and where dogs can go. The, in the, the increasing side is Kakadu. Kakadu is saving the space. In the centre there, the decline is around the Lytton areas. In the upper area, uh, increase in the middle there, is the Brisbane port, not only the roost, but the other areas of Brisbane port. And as you go for the south, the declining area is Raby Bay, and the increase uh, is uh, in a couple of traditional areas and at Manly Roost. So what you see is that the initiative taken early on in the 90s is actually beginning to save the day as these drop and as uh, a disturbance and other things begin to make it difficult for shorebirds to survive. Um, there's a lot of ways you can use this kind of data to evaluate initiatives um, in this kind of way. I'm going to miss that now and go on to Toomba Harbour. Walker Holdings has made three submissions to the Commonwealth. Um, the first one, it withdrew quite quickly in 2016. In 2017, the submission uh, was rather extraordinary, I thought. I wondered whether they actually wanted to build, um, their, their build it in the first place. It uh, recognised that it would extinguish part of the Ramsar site, that it would disturb the wider area for up to 20 years, and that it would disturb shorebirds, that it intended to address this later through mitigation strategies without being clear. In the 2018 submission, uh, it, there was a controlled action declared around that. In the 2018 submission, which led to a controlled action again, 
the submission, I'm being selective here, but said that the uh, development would extinguish less than 1% at the Ramsar area and therefore no discernible effect on shorebirds would occur. There were declines in the number of birds in the Yellow Sea, therefore there was capacity in Norton Bay and the protected areas could become smaller. You might want to wonder about the logic of that. That's a statement in the environmental assessment um, appendices to the report. And therefore, they spare what's known as carrying capacity, a technical term, uh, that is that birds will go somewhere else in the bay. So this is the situation from uh, work done by um, the Wider Study Group. Those areas that will be affected by the wider area because of 20 years of disruption are the Jeff Skinner uh, roost site, a very important roost site, is potentially affected. The Toonda Sandbank is 200 metres from the development and will actually be affected. The Kassam Island, which is a major area for tattlers, will be affected. The Nibi Park, which is 400 metres, will be affected. Oyster Point, which is 550 metres, will be affected. Thornlands and King Street are potentially affected. What's important about this is that those are the areas where around just under 40% of birds in uh, the bay roost every time the high tide is up. Summer tide low counts show that two of the threatened species feed in the area that is, um, that, that where, which will be extinguished, and there are eight other migratory species. Kassam Island, which is directly next to the event, is the largest grey-tailed tattler roost site south of Manly and potentially the largest Wimbrel site. The Toomba Sandbank, which is just on the edge of the development, is an area which of the summer national count had 132 eastern curlew on it, probably the largest group you can get, uh, you would see in the bay at any one time or on the east coast. And the wintering number of wintering birds, junior, junior birds, is about 19. That's about 6.4% of birds, incredibly important because they are the ones that may potentially halt the slide in this particular bird. And there is the satellite tracking of birds. Birds do not move around the bay, they stay in very particular ecological zones, they use efficiency and you will see the green dots are a juvenile bird right next to the development area and the yellow is an adult bird uh, and in a sense they do not move around different areas. And um, so you can conclude from this that if the bay has 1,400 birds, within the area of this development and the area it says it will disrupt, there are about 450 or 32% of this critically endangered bird. The National Summer Count showed that 132 of those birds were on there, or 9.4% and they identified overwintering curlews at 18, which is 6.4% of the local flock. That's what this uh, development is, uh, will uh, potentially extinguish. Remember that the development, by Walker's own words, will take 20 years. That's Kassam Island, that's uh, the sandbank, and that's, if you like to count, if you're good at counting, there are actually two Godricks in there as well, but there are 48 of the 132 on the island. Some of us are obsessed with counting. <laughs> so, fit for purpose, do you think the current legislation, regulatory powers at local, state and federal government level are sufficient to ensure the conservation of habitat in Morton Bay for the survival of the critically endangered eastern curlew? I think uh, I'm not a liar, and, uh, but I think we would have to question whether there are sufficient powers, uh, and you can see the data, you can predict what's going to happen uh, if this development goes ahead. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. Um, we now have some time for some questions. So if um, the two Roberts and Revel, please come up the front. Uh, there should uh, be a microphone somewhere floating around. Um, just before you ask your question, if you just please say your name and where you're from, if you're from an organisation, um, and then try and keep your question short so other people get an opportunity to ask or, or comment. <laughs> 
So please put your hand up and the microphone will come to you if you do have a question. Please don't be shy. Now is your time to ask questions. Yes, one here. Hi, uh, I'm Dylan. I work for the department, but just here as a person. Um, <laughs> uh, the environment. Um, is there any evidence either in terms of migration, but also in terms of roosting or breeding of any adaptation, either to the developments that are happening or to climate change? Is there ever any evidence that any of these species are moving in or as, as a result of what's been happening? Uh, well, the, yes, there is evidence that, that of it changing in the date of migration um, by a few days in a whole series of species as a result of the warming of the Arctic. Uh, so, um, and there is concern in the literature that that um, that birds are now arriving at points which is maybe not uh, in line with when the main food supply is there, and uh, there's evidence of. Uh, some birds going on migration of lower weight uh, and even some adaptation in uh, things like bill structure in the red knots, for example. Other, other Rob, did you have any comments on that? Um, yeah, I'd, I'd say there's certainly evidence that some of these birds are able to adapt and some of them are not. And uh, during the last uh, glacial maximum about 10,000 years ago, you know, some of these birds have a lot less genetic diversity than others. And so they're, they seem to be less adaptive than, than some of the others um, in terms of climate change in the Arctic. And some seem to be more adaptive to um, man-made environments. So there's a curlew in, the, in North America which does okay in agricultural fields. And, rice paddies and other things, whereas the eastern curlew here hasn't figured out how to abandon its, its cherished mudflats. So um, there's a bit of variety in, in how birds are adapting to the, to the changes that are occurring. Um, I I'm, I'm, Ren yeah. I'm Renate. I'm looking after the St. Gate Waiters. And I just wonder if you know anything about artificial lighting in Ramsar sites along the, f uh, along the foreshores. Is there any any research done or any evidence that it's harmful to the raiders? And do they respond? Is that artificial moonlight for them, or s what? How do they? Do you know anything about it? I have no idea. Um, yeah, I, I know there's some. Sometimes nocturnal roosts are different than the, di the ones they use during the day. Um, but we're not, I certainly don't know anything about how artificial light might impact the areas that they're using. Hi, uh, this is just a more general question about um, the international threats the birds are facing, particularly in the Yellow Sea, and that there has been apparently a change in heart um, from the Chinese to basically, you know, change the way they're basically t um, approaching land conservation there. C could anyone talk a little bit about that and, the, and that, that the sort of impact that might be having on building the species back up? Because obviously the main threat to the species, it seems, actually is the pit stop in the Yellow Sea primarily. Um, I wonder if that's something anyone would be able to talk to. Sure. So there's um, uh, there's a student and and Richard's lab at UQ that's looking at uh, different kinds of things that you can do to create habitats, artificial habitats, that'll help the birds along. So um, you can create roosting habitats. You can also um, use artificial wetlands um, for some of these birds. Again, some of these birds don't respond to those kinds of things. Eastern curlew feeding habitat, we haven't cracked how you might be able to do that. So the change in we're not going to reclaim any more coastal wetlands is huge. Um, you know, there was, we had this shrinking place in Bohai Bay for red knots where they were becoming more and more densely concentrated in a smaller and smaller space. And it was a huge percentage of the, the flyway population of that species. And to say that we're not going to be developing that any anymore is, is a huge win um, for those birds. And, and Korea is doing similar things. You know, they were going to 
there's this beautiful four-lane highway that goes right to the edge of the Goom estuary, which is just north of Simon Goom. And they pulled the pin on that project because the economics of what they did in Simon Goom really didn't stack up. So um, there's some good news stories coming out of the LOC. It's been a huge change that 15 years ago we never would have imagined. Do you, do you know anything about the drivers of that change? So what's interesting is the Chinese government overnight, through the State Oceanic Administration, this is what you're talking about, literally unilaterally said, no more reclamation of Yellow Sea except for certain purposes, defence and other things. The drivers of that change are interesting because if it's not this kind of long legislative you know, complexity which we have in Australia, what is it and what drove the Chinese government? And you can speculate. Um, well, certainly, you know, I mean, there's decades of work. So the story was emerging over time. A lot of people engaged, a lot of intergovernmental, non-NGO, all kinds of meetings that have happened uh, across the flyway. But honestly, I think you get somebody like Henry Paulson who has um, more political clout and makes an argument that $30 billion in ecosystem services are maintained if you protect those wetlands. Those kinds of arguments, I'm guessing, I mean, I, I don't know, but I'm guessing that was helped kind of tip it over the edge. Hmm. Other questions? Yes. Oh. I guess uh, my question, Sorry, um, we just my got name's one. Harold. Um, <laughs> Just here as a person as well, but also very much interested in uh, Green Music Australia and what uh, my question is, is what would be the, the top three actions that you would recommend for a lay person, something that we can pass on to our nine to five friends, just regular folk, what can we actually do? Other than building sand pits for the beautiful birds to come and play in. That's not a bad idea. <laughs> um, yeah, I think the, the question you raise is a really important one because this issue has a great sense of powerlessness. Um, uh, I certainly feel the more I, every year, I mean, I've been counting some sites now for 12 years and I've watched the eastern curlew in that area drop from a, a regular count of 450 to just under 200 now. And I know that um, that flock reduces somewhere between 11 and 20 birds per year, whatever I do. So there is a great sense of powerlessness I think there are a number, a number of uh, very pra a number of pr practical things in terms of protecting things like Morton Bay, and that is becoming uh, active about not having dogs chase uh, birds, becoming active with local councillors around proper signage, and about um, making sure that that uh, the, the different spaces are actually uh, and becoming active in that kind of way at the at the grassroots level in terms of uh, disturbance of, of birds. The, the other thing I, is I, I have a kind of um, fantasy. I live in, in, in um, Manly, Wynnum, and um, I, would, I have this sort of dream I wake up with a cold sweat every now and then. That is that people will actually feel a sense of ownership about the birds uh, along the cycle and running track that half the population run along Wynnum every, every day. And the more I think that we can actually get people to feel that they own the birds, that we'll have a greater sense of protection. And to give you an example of that, I talked to someone who um, uh, is, uh, works for, for Coles, who I just got to know locally, who goes to walk along there, who casually said to me uh, six weeks ago that she noticed they were going to cut down, this is not about shorebirds, different birds, cut down three cotton trees along the front. And she said, there are, did you know that there were holes in there and there are birds nesting in there? And I, she said, what do I do about it? So. Um, I know someone who knows someone. And, um, <laughs> and um, the, they re the British and City Council re-evaluated it. And they said two days ago, we're only going to cut down one of the cotton trees. We think that the other two are OK. I won't go into why that strangely happened. But you know, all of a sudden, she's very excited. And someone else stopped me in the street today and said, oh, I hear about the cotton trees. Did you know? So I think that there's a lot of local initiative like that in terms of getting people to feel that they own the birds, uh, that it's part of their world. We could have a welcome back to birds every, on the shorefront every August with all the schools involved. I think they do that, yeah. But yes, they do. We might just ask some other members before we go to the next question just to respond. I'm just going to ask Revel to 
Is that okay? Yeah, Revel, just please. Sure. <laughs> um, yeah, I think there's a Welcome Back uh, Festival in Morton as well. At least I thought I saw one last year. Um, uh, I did want to, I guess, also encourage, um, it's probably the th last thing that Robert touched on, um, uh, being engaged in what impacts are going on and letting people know, especially apparently people like Robert <laughs> who have connections. Um, but also your local ministers and political representatives and um, things like the Toonda Harbour um, uh, development that's proposed. When that's open, the EIS is open for comment. Um, and I know EDO will be um, putting that out, I'm sure. A lot of groups, Redlands 2030s and BirdLife, might maybe even also will be saying, hey, it's open now, get your submissions in. Um, even if it's just a quick, you're concerned about the impacts on Ramsar-listed wetlands or the birds, just to add just one more number, because sometimes the government can rely on those numbers. And I just saw today a development's been refused by the Brisbane City Council. And one of the things the council said was we had I, this isn't exact numbers, but we had 500 submissions and uh, 499 of them were against the development. So it's just a, a bit of ammunition that can be used um, to support a government decision um, to be strong against a development. So I'd really encourage getting involved in those processes. No, but if you do go to the um, EDO Queensland website, which is just... Um, www.edoqld.org.au and then go to events. Uh, it's listed under, it's the only one listed at the moment. Um, so you'll find it there. You do have to register though to get to the details. So, um, it, yeah. I think this lady I've, here has I've been waiting patiently. <laughs> this is really a comment, not a question. I've been studying about China at University of Third Age and we went on a tour in uh, northwestern China last October and we were at Qinghai Lake and there's a it's a vast inland sea, and in the middle of it is Bird Island, where a lot of migratory birds go. It's it's a salty inland sea, and um, we had a th we have a theory that because China is becoming more wealthy, there are millions of Chinese people who are uh, t uh, tourists within their own country, and uh, they were cleaning up Bird Island, and, and it was closed when we were there. It wasn't a season for migratory birds, but they were cleaning out all the predatory um, animals on the island because they wanted the birds' population to increase. So I think that's China, for economic reasons, because of their own internal tourism, are wanting the birds to come back. People like them. That's a very good point and it's also worth thinking about that in comparison to other species because there's other scientists and that will tell you in the conservation space that other species there's far less data on, you know, plants, uh, some invertebrates, you know, other birds and so forth. So these birds, even though, you know, there's obviously an appetite for people to love them, you know, they can be that species and then they think of that, flip it on its head, if you can't get it to work here in Australia with Moreton Bay and Toondah Harbour, with those birds and with that amount of data, what species can you get it to work for? So, yeah, you raise really good points about that. Do we have other questions? Uh, my, I might just ask uh, this uh, lady in, in here whilst... And then we'll come back. I'm just trying to share it around some... Um, hi, I'm Jade. I'm just a student and also a member of Redcliffe Environmental Forum. But um, in one of the presentations, there was a point about how the Senate recommended to create an independent EPA, and I was interested to know how that would change their powers and, like, maybe have a positive outcome. To answer that, but do you want to? No, you go that? for it. You go, yeah. please. Um, so. This is something I know the conservation sector and a lot of people have been pushing for for a long time. Um, obviously, if you're uh, assessing um, a development, as we saw in the frameworks that we have, there is a lot of room for political um, influence uh, from, out, you know, from various angles on the decision if it's just in the minister's hands. Um, and our EPBC Act is, is, has high level of discretion for the minister. Whereas the concept of an independent EPA, um, it's not new. We have um, some states in Australia actually have them. But it, the, basically it creates a bit more separation between the politics and the assessment process. And it depends what powers you give to your um, independent EPA. Um, 
but at least uh, having, giving them the power to assess. Obviously, properly resourcing them is a really, really important one that we're often seeing doesn't happen with our environment departments. Um, but uh, yeah, giving them the power to assess and decide things without um, so much influence from uh, the political space is a really, really important thing um, and could lead to much better results. We would always say that it's also important to still have an avenue to access a court as um, no matter how independent you try to set up a, a, a department essentially of the, of the government, it's always going to be able to be influenced at least by resourcing. Sure, our courts could potentially also be influenced by resourcing and other elements, but it's a little bit harder. There's obviously the separation of powers and whatnot. And so we say keep the court system where you, the public can actually take a matter to the court and have it assessed as whether it's the, the right decision or not, but also having much more independence and better resourcing of our environment departments will go a long way to help as well. Yeah, two, two good examples of that happening. One is with large coal mines and coal seam gas development. There's an independent scientific uh, panel, technical experts who provide technical in input during the decision-making process about impacts on groundwater. Okay, they're not making the final decision, but it adds this extra layer within the governance structure of transparency. To find out decisions by the minister, you either have to go through the FOI process, which is a bit of a nightmare, um, or you know somebody who gives you some information. So that's one example. And the other one is in WA, which I think you might have been referring to, where they do have an independent EPA. The final decision still sits with the minister, but the extra um, um, uh, line there creates a very public decision-making process in which the minister is sitting on a... Uh, a, a recommendation or otherwise from the EPA, and I'm thinking of the shark culls here mainly that occurred over there, and then they have to make a decision either way based upon the expert advice. So it does add that extra layer. I'm, I'm in, all in favour of it. Yeah. Any other comments from the panel? To Robert or Robert? <laughs> no. Other questions? Some, anyone we haven't heard of? Yes, at the back. Hi, I'm uh, Dave and uh, work in community services and uh, as hopefully that includes fauna and flora <laughs> because I walk uh, down there between Oyster Point and Stratty Ferry for the last five years every week and I'm just wondering, is there anything that we can show that would potentially stop this project for, um, forever that shows what damage like sediment coming over all the ground south for many kilometres, uh, covering things like fiddler crabs that I see only come up once a month when it's very high tide. The rest of the time the soil's baked. So if any sediment or any change in any of that area, then that would be the annihilation of uh, quite a lot of fauna there, including the birds. So could we do anything that shows potential damage that could stop this forever? I think that's to you, Rob Bush. I don't know anything about sediment. Um, the, it's interesting in that the, there's quite a lot of scientific work on the benthos, that's the food in the mud, in, in that I, when I do literature searches in Moreton Bay. But there's precious little of it, as far as I can see, and I think people like Richard might be able to clarify this because I'm an amateur doing researches of, searches of this that actually link that to shorebirds. There are some, but by and large, there are the link between the quality of the food in the mud related to different species prefer different kinds of things in the mud. Uh, uh, and uh, shorebirds is not well articulated in Morton Bay. It and there are a lot of studies of, of the benthos, that's the substance, but not, not related to, specifically related to um, shorebird and uh, uh, in particular to what's known as carrying capacity, that is the ability of different parts of the bay to support shorebirds. Especially uh, when, if they started dredging and what they uh, have said how much dredging they would be doing no matter if they're trucking it away or not well, how we, much would that sediment would be covering yeah. all those areas south? Well, um, the Walker submission does um, say that it has not done the work on hydrology and uh, on uh, Bentos says that it hasn't done any of that. Whether it proposes to do it, I don't know. But it is an important issue. It, there are many documents that say that, that, that it is an important issue and needs to be explored. Thank you. Other questions? Oh, Richard, Professor Richard Fuller might have a comment on it. 
Oh, I was going to ask a separate one. Question. Okay. okay. Yes, of course. Um, I, I was intrigued by the um, argument being made around the impact on the Ramsar sites. I think it was Robert that yeah. showed that. Um, that the argument was it's well, it's one percent of the Ramsar site, so yeah. that's kind of okay. And I, I was interested to learn from the lawyers here, perhaps, how that sits within the Ramsar Convention. Are they quite happy for? areas to be excised from Ramsar sites, providing they're fairly small. Um, what kinds of arguments are, are going to resonate uh, in the Ramsar Convention if just cutting bits out for development is actually OK? Do you want to like to go first? Just as you were talking, I was thinking the question was going to be, what is the difference between 1% and what is the difference between 50%? And uh, percentage-wise, it, it shouldn't even enter the equation. The tests under the convention are about ecological character. And more specifically, they're about changes in the ecological character made up of the components and the process and the ecological values. When you look at the convention and the subsequent resolutions that have, that have followed the, the document, it's not necessarily a negative or positive discussion. It's a change in the ecological character. Okay, in some of the reporting documentation, they say, Moreton Bay, how much has the ecological character changed? Or has it changed? Is it positive or negative or both? Right, so there's nothing about percentages, nothing about you know um, this amount versus that amount. So it should all be about that, really. And the, the crux of the matter would boil down towards that. And I think also at the federal level. So when the federal government comes to make that decision, the test is in the Ramsar in the Ramsar Convention, which is followed through to the EPBC Act, as far as I understand it, is it likely to have or will have a significant impact on the ecological character of a Ramsar site? Next question is, what is the ecological character of that Ramsar site? So, yeah, I I think at the at the they would be very upset, or they should be upset at the international level, and we should be concerned about it whether it's 1% or 99%. Yeah. May I add to yes. the, in terms of the boundary change, I think it was touched on um, also, it should only under our conventions and under the UPBC Act um, be changed if it's in the national interest. Um, and as we, we mentioned, <laughs> it's a hard argument, I think, to, uh, to argue. I'm no doubt that, uh, and have heard anecdotally that people are currently trying to argue um, that it is in the national interest around the world to the to the people making these decisions. Um, to my knowledge, the only time in Australia that that's uh, the boundary's been allowed to change in the national interest under that test was uh, in a place in Victoria for I think it was a port. Um, so you can you know a port slightly more arguable, but here we have a multi-purpose private development. Um, so it'll be very interesting to see how they go. <laughs> I think, I think one of the limitations which I think you, you raised is that, that Toomba Harbour and its development, it depends what, what you mean by, by where the development is. If you take the small area which is going to be annexed, it's quite small and you could have you know, much less than 1%. But if you take the impact, it's much wider than that. Uh, and also, the other, as I understand it, the act doesn't take into account what has happened before so that you have the extinction, the extinction of, of the largest uh, roost site 12 years, uh, 15 years before, uh, 300 metres away. But that doesn't... Now, of course, we've got a different set of... So, in a sense, we don't have to... And then there'll be another one. So, in a sense, it's, um, you know, a death by a thousand cuts, which is not my phrase. It's David Milton. But, um, yeah. Um, so, in that sense... The, the act doesn't seem to me to take into, um, it doesn't to be able to accommodate the fact that it only accommodates this development, not the one before or the wider context. But in an ecological sense, the wider context is extremely important if the purpose is actually conservation. Both at the local level and the international level as well. Uh, some people we haven't heard from. Yes, at the back. Thank you. So, um I uh, have, you know, been following this story for a long time. I'm um, a filmmaker, so, uh, you know, there are some filmmakers like me and Randall Wood here who are very interested in finding the way to get this story out beyond, um, I mean, the flyway story, not just Turned to Harbour, but the reason we came at the film was because of Turned to Harbour. 
Um, I'm very interested that there's a federal election coming up. It's not going to be part of our story so much because ours is a longer term film that we're working on. But I am interested to know whether there's a very um, palatable or a, a concept that can be put from a legal perspective during the federal election campaign um, that you're considering because there's a lot of knowledge here and a lot of, um, I mean, it's a very complicated aspect for people who are not lawyers, but if there is a way of distilling it, in, such as the impact that you just mentioned, 1% may seem like a small amount, but the impact, what percentage is that if we wanted to correlate with something that the general media could jump onto for the federal election? I was, I was thinking about that question today and trying to think out what, what would you actually say. And I was thinking of, uh, that the only way I could think of doing it, because, I mean, who cares about waiters, you know, down in the street, so to speak, is that supposing uh, you created a story that said that Brisbane City Council is going to allocate 1% of all of Brisbane's uh, land to a wetland, a fantastic international wetland. And everyone says, isn't that a great idea? And then a little bit further down in the page, you, you discover that the wetland that's going to be created is actually at the international airport and that Brisbane will be without an international airport. And all of a sudden the mood changes. And if you could think of, it's really the reverse of what we're talking about here. How could you actually create a story like that that had a twist in it that would suddenly get people thinking, God, no, oh, I really like that idea. No, no, I've got to get to the plane. Migratory Day, the 11th of May this year, yeah. and that might be the election day. You could sort of say, wow, <laughs> this is a big day. <laughs> yeah. Other comments from the panel about that, your idea for how to distill it for a community? There are a lot of complex regulatory and governance issues going on there. Do you have any ideas? Well, I mean, certainly the, the Places You Love campaign is yeah. um, live and active. Bird Life is active in that space. Most of there's so many NGOs that are active in that space. The Places You Love campaign is really looking at, okay, so environmental legislation in this country is failing. It's not doing what it was meant to do. What do we need in its place? Labor is taking election commitments to the next election to um, put in an EPA, to look at revamping the act. So there are already election issues that are being taken to the election. In a, in a broader context and sort of tuned as one of many examples of how the act really might not work very well. I mean, does it make economic sense to be building an apartment complex when sea level rise, you know, right at sea level? Does that make sense? Yeah. Aren't there other places we could put an apartment complex besides in an internationally significant wetland? In Australia, we're blessed with lots of space how in the world is it that we've decided that the apartment complex has to be here and not somewhere else? And the, the planning process and all of those issues have been talked about in the Places You Love campaign, that those kinds of things need to be addressed. So there's a big issue that's coming to the election, um, we hope. Um, and Tunda is definitely one of the examples of, of many. Yes, just so. briefly. Yes, um, yes. I think it's an excellent question. I might use it also to mention that it is uh, a decision of uh, a minister, so a politically re um, elected person at the end of the day. So it could have a big impact. Um, it's, uh, it'll be interesting to see. And also I just wanted to mention that the state government also does have the power to actually um, withdraw the PDA. Uh, so just something to plant a little seed in your mind <laughs> of what we can be asking for. Just one comment before we go to the next question. In terms of the, the law, the language I've heard is that we need a red line. So at the moment, the laws are discretionary and they're applied in a discretionary way and they've got other flaws. But where is the red line? Where do we say no to particular developments? At what point? And that EPBC, a graph I put up before, 97% of projects going through. Is there a way that this particular project could be illustrative of what that red line is and that the brains here could say there, this is where the red line should be for this and make it very simple so that then you take that message in the next you know, six to eight weeks um, out there? Because you're here doing a talk about the law. 
feels to me the law is wanting, you've identified that, for what I think the punter needs to understand, well, what should the law be doing? Where is that red line? Can I save my a comment on that, actually? Just um, Sorry, I'm jumping in. But um, in the US, there's been 40 cases. Um, I, I think international precedent is really important. There have been 40 cases, one against the Trump administration, significant environmental cases, and the most significant was this week, and it's a huge win for birds, actually, with Earth, Earth Justice coming out and basically beating Trump on his quest to drill oil right through the Arctic and Atlantic Sea ocean areas, which is a big win for birds. And I think we need to celebrate that and also apply that international precedent to kind of the Australian context and look at how we can, you know, learn and, and bring those international examples as shining examples of, of, of a win and where wins need to and can happen. Anyway, that's a statement, but it's also yeah. a question in yes, terms of how you. we can do that. Um, we might, because we've only probably got another minute or two, is, um, anyone who hasn't asked a question before I come to you? Uh, just this lady and then we'll, we'll get here. Thank you. I'm curious to know whether maybe countries, other countries that have made commitments such as Ramsar, whether they've tried to back down on their areas too, whether we knew anything about other people. Yes, the answer is yes. Um, is Japan one of them? Japan is an interesting case. Yes. Um, from what I've seen with Japan, they have um, been a bit of a champion of the convention of late. Um, partly because they had a win to say that you can include rice paddies as Ramsar sites. But, ecologically speaking for birds, a lot of waders do spend their time in rice paddies in Japan. So they were may, may able to make that artificial argument around it. Um, may interesting, again, they're not a signatory to the Convention on Migratory Species for their stance on whales. Right, so they pick and choose, and the and US is the same, right? So US not signatory to Convention on Migratory Species, even though they went in the drafting process all the way to the end, right, to manipulate it as they wanted it, and then pulled out, right, which they have done in other treaties as well. But there's a there's a there's a thing called the Montreux Record under the Ramsar Convention, which is meant to be for sites that have been so badly degraded or lost their ecological character or had a change that they go onto this kind of endanger list. And we had looked at it recently, and it's just been an underutilised mechanism of the governance structure of Ramsar. Um, but there are loads of places in Australia that could go on that list. We don't put them on the list for political reasons. Um, I can't think of other things to say to that question. Any other thoughts about Ramsar in parts of the world where? It, it's interesting that the Ramsar, you know, is that the is in Iraq, and um, Saddam Hussein drained the Ramsar wetland. As a, to get strategic advantage in the um, Iran-Iraq war. Um, and it's now been rehabilitated full of um, wetland birds. Um, so the original site where the convention was agreed to um, has been through the mill and come out well the other end. But it which is hard to get that mud the food level well, it's been rehabilitated and doing well. It's a, mostly a wetland area, not not, not a not a, a shorebird sure. area. But uh, it's an example that you can actually reverse things. Yes. Um, fantastic from this gentleman about celebrating, and back to the original. Um, the original question I raised about calls to action, and this lady here mentioned that the 11th of May is World Migratory Bird Day, something like that. I just wanted to put a shout out to everyone here around the uh, community conversation that we're having. On the 11th of May at 11 o'clock, there is a, uh, a walk out of work for 11 minutes inspired by the uh, Stop Adani movement. Perhaps we could put our momentum into that as well and make it more of a, a global sort of uh, initiative because as we know, this migratory bird experience is heavily linked into all of the environmental actions that are going on, and this is the climate change election. That's what it's being dubbed. So potentially clocking onto other movements and using the momentum that's already being built in such, such force there and, and issuing some of these beautiful bits of education around the, the migratory bird experience and, and, and the love of birds there. That was my only offering. And thank you so much for all of your time and answers, guys. Do we have one last question or are you? She, this, this lady will be the last. I think we have to, we probably have to finish. <laughs>
Um, I don't have a question. I just want to share something with uh, you. Um, we had in Sengate a uh, lagoon where, where they feed a lot of bread, and we have all sorts of contaminations and illnesses and so on. And we fought for years to stop people from feeding bread. Last year, they had a competition for children. They um, designed signs, and three of the winner, winning signs have been placed around the lagoon, and the feeding has stopped about 95%. So I think uh, if we should start uh, involving the children, and I think they do that in, in Prum a lot, uh, with children festivals, with uh, little cutout birds and all that stuff, I think that's where we really have to start uh, as a community involvement uh, on the grassroots, get the kids going, have them make the signs, let them make the signs, not the pretty signs, but the rough grassroots signs. And I think that's, that's where we, uh, it's, it's one way to get the public involved. I think that's exactly what Elise is trying to do with her youth organisation. Um, so I think we might have to finish there. Uh, thank you all for coming. Uh, please thank our, our speakers tonight. Um, if anyone wanted to listen back to it, it will be recorded and I think we'll be putting out some type of media release about where you can find that uh, link. So maybe search uh, perhaps at the end of next week and it should be available. If not, just Google my name at QUT and harass me and I'll send it to you. Uh, but thank you all for coming and um, I hope you enjoyed the conversations that we had. Thank you.